Uh, welcome to part two of our VAT taxation session for CTA 2019. Now, the objective is to continue uh, learning about uh, VAT. In part one, we dealt with the fundamentals of VAT, and in this um, shooting, we are looking at the learning outcomes to understand. Oh, the objective is to understand the different adjustments that may need to be made to the VAT position that you can initially uh, obtain using the principles that we learned before. We want to appreciate the administrative aspects of VAT um, and also uh, essentially those are the key issues and also have a dis discussion around uh, tax planning. So tax planning is not a separate topic so we'll be incorporating it as we discuss it as we go. So a recap of the formula. Remember to come up with your VAT payable and your VAT refundable or your VAT refundable. Uh, it's, it's, it's a culmination of output tax being subtracted from the input tax to, to get the fundable, the refundable of VAT payable. It will be refundable if the input tax exceeds the output tax. So adjustments are mainly dealt with in, in section 17. And there's a lot of tax planning that could happen uh, by the taxpayer in knowing that the initial tax position can be adjusted later on. So taxpayers can actually even try and take advantage of this whole um, leeway to adjust. But it's unavoidable mainly um, for, for in the main uh, because in some cases your input tax calculation has to be based on, on an estimate, especially where you have meat supplies. Um, that, that usually is a, a source of adjustment. So there could be a change of use and that change of use may cause us to uh, adjust the initial assessment and the tax that was computed and paid. The change in use from taxable supplies to non-taxable supplies, uh, or it could be vice versa. That change in use could be um, either way. So it will, if, if you are changing from um, more of using it for taxable supplies to more of using it for non-taxable supplies, uh, if, the, if there was that under overestimation of the taxable supply, it would mean that you're claiming more so you will have uh, input tax adjustment. But where a taxpayer has begun to use the supply more to make non-taxable supply, that will result in an output tax adjustment. So section 17.1 is where you have goods which are not necessarily capital in nature which were subsequently used to make non-taxable supplies. So the output tax adjustment is done, but take note now, instead of using consideration less VAT in terms of the value of supply based on the cost, you are now using the open market value. If input tax was originally denied, then no adjustment. Section 17.2, there's a, there's a slight change there in that now we're dealing with the supply of capital goods or deemed supplies. So it's not necessary if the cost of the goods was less than $60, US dollars, and if input tax was also originally denied. But the value of supply this time is now the lesser of the OMV or cost. So the issue is why, what's the change? With capital goods, I think the, 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 the reason is an investment has already happened, and although an adjustment may be anticipated later, the taxman is, is not uh, particularly insisting on, on the change because there's also an investment that has already happened. So for fringe benefits, fringe benefits are deemed supplies for which output tax should be calculated. 
Um, what is happening with fringe? What happens with fringe benefits is that, uh, uh, for payroll purposes or for employment income purposes, an employer may, over and above the salary arrangement, um, award benefits to an employee. And this awarding of benefits, although it is a fringe benefit in terms of the income tax for income tax purposes. It means the employer has supplied to, is deemed to have supplied to the employee and VAT arises. So one would now need to look at what in particular has the employer been deemed to have supplied and then we go through the whole process again of looking at whether it is a standard rate of supply uh, or whether it's a supply at all is it a standard rate of supply and therefore what's the value of supply and the time of supply. So you, you, for all items that are originally exempt or that are exempt anyway, such as accommodation, if the, if the employer supplies accommodation to their employee, although it is a fringe benefit and there is a benefit, but it's a fringe benefit of an exempt supply. Some suppliers are zero rated and some supplies are supplies of entertainment, which means it would have been denied input tax in the first place. So one would need to look at the underlying supply. It excludes monetary benefits because money is not is neither goods nor services, and therefore you cannot have any output tax. Section seventeen four um, deals with goods that were acquired prior to the fixed date. This is no longer as relevant because the fixed date was in 2004. But the, the key issues there were if you had gone and bought goods under the sales tax regime and now you sell them in the VAT regime, what happens to the claiming of input tax which was never charged because it was in the sales tax regime? Um, you, you can have instances of goods that were acquired after the fixed date but where you need to do an import tax adjustment and apply a tax fraction to the lesser of cost or AP. You also have transactions around the fixed property transactions where ordinarily when VAT has not been charged by the original supplier, it, you cannot claim import tax. But with fixed, fixed property transactions, you can have the original supplier being a non-registered operator, therefore they would not have charged VAT. But the taxpayer who bought that property, because it is fixed property, if the taxpayer that bought the property is a registered operator, they are allowed to claim input tax, which is called notional tax, a tax in notion or in idea only. And this notional tax is premised on the, the any stamp duty that was paid and not stamp duty that was charged. So you can only claim if you paid the stamp duty. So we move on to 17.5 where you start having an increase in the use of capital goods. The, the whole issue is around what is the timing. It's about the financial year, the time of supply, uh, not invoice date, and the tax fraction being applied. And then the sale of a business as a going concern is, is a key adjustment that you may need to do, but the criteria for identifying a going concern is important. What is a going concern? The whole story about it being a tanky, uh, it should be in the agreement, it should be expressed that we're selling the, the, the business as a going concern. And by tanky, by the way, I meant that you, no material uh, adjustments need to be done for, for the new, for the buyer to operate that, that business. That sale is going to be zero rated. And the de minimis rule applies in terms of 90% plus. Adjustments to post-sale transactions may then create output tax adjustments. So you can sell a, a going concern, but then you immediately start stripping. So you've taken advantage of the zero rate, but post, post the, that sale, the zero rate in stocks. Calculation of adjustments involves determining items that did not 
qualify for input tax deduction and the proportion of, for, of use for taxable versus non-taxable is then also applied. Where, so in consolidations, for instance, or in acquisitions and mergers, you, you need to always look out for the buying and selling of the business as a common concern and the necessary adjustments. Where the two parties are connected persons, then deeming provisions are invoked to apply the open market value if consideration is below the market price. Okay. In terms of administration, please go and have a look at pre-incorporation expenses, uh, irrecoverable debts, VAT registration, and for each, by the way, we are, we are showing you the relevant section. When, when are you liable for registration? When do you voluntarily register? What is the registration procedure? What of deregistration? You need to understand tax periods because you have categories A to D. Category A is you accumulate transactions for two months from December to January and then your VAT payable or refundable is calculated at, by the 25th of February. Category B, you accumulate transactions between January and February, and on the 25th of March, you then are liable to have paid the VAT. Um, category C, monthly, and payable on the 25th of the following month. Category D is negotiated for, 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 some, for some taxpayers who operate seasonally, and therefore it may not make sense to have a, a shorter uh, tax period. You need to understand the submission of returns. Um, Section 20 is about invoices. Invoices are a crucial document for the claiming of VAT. Very crucial. And so there's requirements in issuing it, including the date, the name of the client, the registration number of the supplier and the client where necessary. Uh, the features of that invoice, there are so many features that you need to be able to clearly articulate whether it's clearly marked uh, tax invoice, uh, the output tax, the, the chargeable, and all those things. So it's important for you to study that and have an appreciation of what are the details on the face of the tax invoices and the requirements in the issue. You also need to understand section 56 about agents and auctioneers. Please also go and look into objections and appeals, lodging an objection, grounds of an objection, late objections, appeals. All these things are um, also closely tied to legal aspects and from a 360 perspective, when you violate tax rules, you also think about audit when you start talking of non-compliance with laws and regulations, no clear. And, and a lot of other things, in, including ethics as well, in terms of how you calculate your tax, are you taking advantage of government loopholes and it's a thin line between tax planning and being unethical. So thank you very much for listening to part two of VAT, which was more of your adjustments and